Wherever you are around the world today, it's great you can be here with us. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful that you can join us wherever you are around the world. Well, as I say every week, when I was younger, I was taken to a meeting by a Catholic priest. People sat in a number of of circles and then some people said some prayers, some people sang some songs, or well, everybody did. And then they read from the scriptures and someone shared a message. And to be honest with you, I experienced the power of God right there. Now, what we're going to do today is we're not putting on a show or a program. What we're going to do is we're going to invite all of us, wherever we are, to join in a time of prayer through music and through prayers. And then we're going to open the scriptures and we're going to ask God to speak to us on this particular special day. Pentecost is a very exciting day for me. And I'll tell you why as we go through this day. So let's today, why don't we pray and then let's begin to sing and let's pray that God would bring a victory into our life, which is what this first song that we're going to pray uh, in a moment. So loving Father, we come before you today and we pray that Lord God, in all of our lives, that we would see a victory, that we would see you reign in our life in power, in impact, in freedom and in purpose. And so Lord God, would you come? No matter what we're doing right now, we just focus our minds, we focus our spirit and our heart, and we invite you into the rooms and into the places where we are right now. Come Holy Spirit, may your victory reign upon all of us. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph.
We so often pray about surrendering our life. Well, today here as we celebrate and as we remember Pentecost, surrendering has a very different and even deeper meaning today. And we're going to unfold that as we, as we share. And so, Father, we ask today that you bless us in all that we do and all that we share. Father, I pray that the words that I'd speak today would not be words that uh, I want to say, but what you would want to say. And Lord, if there's anything I say that shouldn't be said, may it be forgotten instantly. But plant within each of us your word, because that, that will change our lives. And Father, we make this prayer in the name of Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today I want to I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk about all that God has has done in my life because of the Holy Spirit and has done in many people's lives. Well, we're going to go to the scriptures a number of times today, and we're going to look at some of the prayers of the church today uh, in terms of understanding the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit can be released more powerfully in our life. So let's look as we begin, let's go uh, to Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one verse 4, and if you're reading from the Bible that I use, it's on page 1017, and it says this, and we'll go from verse 1. In the, in the verse book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after having given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles and to whom he'd chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Luke, who's writing to, to the, uh, about the beginning of the church, is basically summarising Jesus' life, that, that Jesus came and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he gave instructions on how to live and, he, and it was for 40 days. And then he says in verse 4, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. And what was the promise of the Father? This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Pentecost was when the Holy Spirit came down upon the earth and came upon the first apostles and the disciples. And we're going to, we're going to read that from chapter 2. And so we continue. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them. And a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And look at, did you hear that? All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages. as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. At this, uh, and at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pygeria and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. I love this passage of scripture and I've read it I, countless times in my life because something clearly happened to them on that day. Just, just to summarise who they were, these were the apostles, these were the disciples. They had been with Jesus for years. They'd seen all the big miracles. They'd seen him do amazing things. And yet they had been the ones that had betrayed him. They had been the ones that had run away when, when things got tough and when, and when Jesus was crucified. And then they were also the ones that didn't initially believe when the women came and said, he's risen. And they'd wandered for 40 days. And you can imagine in those 40 days, even Jesus appearing to them, you know, what did all of this mean? And, 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 and the fact that they lacked in some sense still the ability to go forth and do what Jesus had said to them. Because we remember when he ascended, he ascended, he said, I want you to go, go out to the whole world and proclaim the gospel. I want you to make disciples. I want you to baptise people and make disciples. But yet they hadn't really done it. And here we are, days, weeks after, 
uh, after the resurrection of Jesus. And then all of a sudden they're gathered and this promised Holy Spirit that Jesus had spoken about over and over and over again that Jesus had said would come had finally arrived. And here they were somehow changed, somehow with abilities that initially uh, portrayed itself as their ability to speak in languages that people who were from all these other places could understand them. Something was clearly different. They were giddy with God. And, and so here they were and, and people in that last sentence it says, and people said, well, they're just filled with new wine. They've, they've been drinking all day. But Peter stands up and he says in verse 14, in verse 14, Peter stands up and he says, but Peter standing with the 11 raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these, these are not drunk. These apostles, disciples are not drunk as you suppose for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Everyone, ever, even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Something happened to these people. Lord God, we just pray right now that something would happen to us as we listen. Not to my voice or to the words that I would speak because what anything I can say is just limited. But if we hear your voice, it changes everything. See, as I say, they were changed. Uh, they, they couldn't live out even fully the, the gospel. But now if we then pick up the scriptures and we begin to go into the book of Acts, the beginning of the church, the begin, the, what the early Christians, we see time and time again they spoke with power. They acted wisely. They, they had a wisdom that was beyond themselves. There was a courage in them. Despite trouble, difficulty and struggle, they somehow were completely different than even they were when Jesus walked on the, on the earth with them. Who's the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is God, a divine person of equal dignity to God, the Father and the Son. Again, look at this. The Holy Spirit is God a divine person of equal dignity to God the Father and the Son. Um, now, now, just to be a little technical for a minute, the church didn't quite define their full understanding of the, of the Holy Spirit, not until the year 381 at, at the Council of Constantinople in the early days of the church, and, and we still see it today, when there were things to discuss and there were issues to decide and where, and where there were great debates that, that had to be had, they would have these councils where leaders would get together and leaders would discern, the elders, the, the bishops would get together and they would discern with, why, with wisdom and try to understand things. And, and we can say, well, why was it not until the year 381 that they really came out with a real statement on what the Holy Spirit was? And the reason was because they were still formulating their language around who God the Father was. And they were still formulating their language among who Jesus was and even the divinity of Jesus and Jesus being both God and man. And then they came to the Holy Spirit. Have a look at this on the screen. And this is what they said in the Council of Constantinople in 381, the, uh, that the Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is adopt, adored, or worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. Many of us, when we go to church each week, we hear those words. The, the Holy Spirit is the Lord, is the giver of life. Because as, we, as we've seen, is the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes to us, the Holy Spirit brings life to our physical being. We go back to the very beginning of the creation of the world. It says that the, that the, the world was made through the power of the Spirit. We also know that our spiritual life, our life with God comes because of the power of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. So when it says the Lord, the Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life, it's true. It's true that the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us life. And we say that the Holy Spirit is consubstantial with the Father and Son, meaning made of the same stuff and proceeds from the Father to us. So how do we... 
And why I want to spend my time today is how do we pray to the Holy Spirit? How do we interact with the Holy Spirit in our life? And then I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Jesus told us consistently, Jesus told us consistently to pray for the Holy Spirit. But here's an interesting thing, is that the Holy Spirit, Jesus had also said, was that when I ascend a paraclete, a helper, the Holy Spirit is coming. And so we can stop and we can say, well, why did Jesus then need to say, call for the Holy Spirit, ask for the Holy Spirit, if at the same time the Holy Spirit was coming? Well, have a look at this scripture in Luke chapter 11, verse 9. And so I say to you, Jesus speaking, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so what we see is that there's this parallel, two things taking place at the same time. On the one hand, the Holy Spirit is coming. But on the other hand, make sure you're asking for the Holy Spirit to come. And if we read the book of Acts, the beginning of the church, the early start of the church, we see over and over and over again the apostles and St. Paul consistently praying for the Holy Spirit to come. And they would pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon new converts, people who were coming to faith and the church was growing in those days. They, they would pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon men and women who had particular mission or ministry or tasks that they were meant to do. They would pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon people, that they would have the gifts they needed to do what had to be done in their life. And so the, the, the apostles and St. Paul consistently, even though the Holy Spirit had come, continued to pray, oh, come Holy Spirit. In the Catholic sacraments we see um, in the church, there's a consistent calling of the Holy Spirit to come upon the sacraments so that these sacraments are where God dwells and we experience God within them. That there's what's called this technical epiclesis, that the Holy Spirit would fall. In, in the Catholic Mass, when, when the priest extends his hands, palms down over the gifts, the bread and the wine, praying that they would become by the power of the Holy Spirit the very body and blood of Christ, there is this consistent all the time the church is calling to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and Jesus keeps saying, call to the Holy Spirit, which leads me to this question. How often do you call the Holy Spirit? It's a horrible question really, isn't it? Because to be honest with you, there are many days that I forget and that I don't and that I just have my faith and my belief and I'm going on with all I know and I'm not calling with the Holy Spirit to infuse in power the things that I'm called to do and to be. We need to continue to invoke, to call, to ask the Holy Spirit to come in power, to guide us, to purify us and to give us his gifts and graces. That we need that now. That we can't achieve in our personal lives in if those of us in ministry, in our ministry lives, those of us in the church, we can't achieve unless the Holy Spirit comes and its power is invited anew over and over and over. So yes, the Spirit has come, but then we need to invite that Holy Spirit um, to come into our lives as well. Um, it, it's interesting that when we ask for what's already given, it says to us that we actually want it. When, 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 when it's already given, can I have some? It's, where, it's, there's, it's a question of desire. I want this within me. I want this within me. I wonder if that's the reason God did it that way. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is there, but I want some. It's a little bit like when I come home from, from, from work when my children were little and I'd bring home something, you know, candy or lollies or something and I wanted, and I, you know, I'd bring it home and it didn't take much for, the, for all my five children to gather around and say, can I have some? I had, I was willing to give, but their desire to have was what we're meant to have when it comes to the Holy Spirit, a desire for this power to come in our life. 
We see, we see this calling in the church's structures all the time of the Holy Spirit uh, to come to us. Um, and, and we're meant to pray this prayer all the time. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. If you've ever watched the, the beginning of a conclave when a pope is elected, they sing a song that all the time in Latin, Vene Sancte Spiritus, come, Holy Spirit. I wonder if the reason some ministries, I wonder if the reason some people have got great ideas, I, I wonder if some of the people who are meant to do wonderful things for God in their life, in their marriages, in, their, in the things they do, I wonder if one of the reasons that people don't get the full total experience of what could be done for this simple reason, they don't ask the Holy Spirit to help. And so they come with their faith, but they don't come with power. I just, I just wonder. I just wonder. We read, in, if, if, we, if we look at what the popes have said in recent decades, multiple popes in recent decades, now, you know, these senior pastors of the Catholic Church, many of them have, have consistently said, let's pray for a new Pentecost a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So see, it, it isn't just back then that the, the Scriptures said pray, pray uh, that it would be let's pray that the Spirit would come. Even now we're being encouraged to pray, Holy Spirit come. To all of my staff here, you know, some of you are here, some are not. Well, what would happen if we as a team and we as a ministry if we really cried out more deeply today, oh, come Holy Spirit upon us and all that we do. What might God do? What power might we release or God release among us? And so it is for many of us. What might we do if we, if we, if we devote ourselves to the Holy Spirit, the power to come uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, have a look at this. It says this. It says that we're to pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray in the Spirit. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Now, different people interpret that in different ways. But to pray in the Spirit is to pray with the voice of God, the heart of God, the love of God, the, our lives surrendered to God and surrendered to the Holy Spirit, that we are in union with what God is saying. That we pray a prayer that is, that is a, prayer, a prayer of prayer in the Spirit that's connected to God himself, right? Prayers in, addressed to the Holy Spirit in inver, invariably ask the Holy Spirit to come for some holy purpose. Let me say that again. Prayers that are prayed to the Holy Spirit invariably ask the Holy Spirit to come for some holy purpose. We pray when we pray to the Holy Spirit, we pray that the Holy Spirit would fill, to fill, to sanctify, as in make make holy, to make it usable, to make us usable. We pray that power is given. We pray that it is to console. The Holy Spirit would come to console, to counsel, to comfort. We pray that the Holy Spirit would come to convict people of their sin. Or what do we mean by that? To convict people that they're not being all that they can be. To convict people that the life they're living is not the life they could live and the power they could have and all that they could achieve if they were to, if they were to invite God into their life and got the Holy Spirit to come. And so we pray to the Holy Spirit to guide, to teach, and so on. In other words, the Holy Spirit leads us to this place of mystery. And I'm a Catholic and, and, and what I've found in my Catholic life is so often... We want it to be not scary. We don't want it to be too freaky. We don't want it to be too wild. We want it to be kind of normal and contained. But that doesn't seem to be what I read in the scriptures about the early church. The early church, the amazing things that they did. 
their ability to, to bring conversion and transformation into the lives of people and to bring healing and miracles into people's lives. I, I would love to live more powerfully like that. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, why is it sometimes hard to relate to? Well, it's so easy to relate to God the Father because it's like a person. Well, the language is like a person and we can conceive of a person. Jesus, the same, we can conceive of a person. But the language of the Scriptures, the language of the Scriptures oh, and, and the biblical imagery of the Scriptures is that of breath or wind or cloud or oil or dove uh, and, and they're not as easy to conceive and relate to and to have a personal relationship with. And so we see for many people, we see for many people, we don't talk much about the Holy Spirit because it's hard to have that personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Even though I said when we began that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit has different names to describe the different abilities that the Holy Spirit has. It's, he's described as a guide, a comforter, a counsellor, a helper, the advocate, a giver of life. These different manifestations are seen, and I'll describe it in a simple way, it's reveal, he reveals himself to man with by actions or events that show you something about himself because the Holy Spirit's a bit abstract, like how do I grab onto him? But he reveals himself to man in different ways. Bruce has often shared with me the story of how the Holy Spirit revealed himself to Bruce when he was 13. And I describe it very much as a Mack truck experience, a bang, before Bruce was unsure. Was God even real? Was God even there? What his upbringing taught him so, but he didn't really know. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit revealed himself and he knew. Whereas I would describe myself as an unfolding of more of the Holy Spirit in my life, an understanding more, a re revealing more of himself to me. Very much the giver of life. I had life beforehand. I was taught by my parents and my grandparents, but I came to more of an understanding and more of a maturity in knowing the Holy Spirit more. But that didn't just finish on one day. It's a totally unfolding always every day of more of the Holy Spirit in my life. I, I get a picture of very much like a rose petal, a rose bud, and the rose unfolds itself. And that's, I feel like, how the Holy Spirit has shared himself with me and still continues to do so. Is one right or wrong? No. They're just different ways that the Holy Spirit reaches different people. Bruce and I are different personalities, so maybe for you when the Holy Spirit has shared or revealed himself more to you for the first time or an ongoing time, it's even another different experience because we're, we're, we're different. We see things differently. We react to things differently. Maybe for me, if it was a Mack truck experience, I'd be running the other way scared stiff. I don't know. Maybe, you know, there's um, stubbornness in different people's lives that God had to come and go bang or you wouldn't have met, seen him, wouldn't have met him in that way. I love it in Job 33, 4, it says, The breath of the Almighty gives me life. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. And in the Amplified Version, it goes on to say in the last line, gives me life which inspires me. The Holy Spirit gave me life that inspired me to be better, to push more, to have more courage, to persevere more. The Holy Spirit can do that for you too. The Holy Spirit can reveal for the first time, reveal himself to you for the first time, reveal God to you for the first time if you're not sure. But the Holy Spirit can also every day 
show you more and more of the abilities and the gifts and the understanding that he can give us so we can, we can live a better life, a giver of life, a life which inspires me to be the best me that I can be. So I'm asking you to support us in this ministry to donate so that you can be inspired more to live a greater life, but you and others who don't know yet, yet know him can get to know this giver of life, this Holy Spirit that inspires us to be the best that we can be. So I'm asking you to donate right now. It won't affect any of the rest of the, the message that will come on if you click on the button right now. I'm asking you, for yourself and for others to come and learn more about the Holy Spirit. Well, I was a young teenager. I was a young teenager and I was taken to a meeting where people sat in a number of circles and, and uh, they sang a few songs and, and then someone stood and gave a talk. And I remember I went and it was, it was, it was October the 7th, um, it was October the 7th, the first day that I went. And I went on this particular day and, um, and I went and I listened to someone speak and they talked about and they talked about the Holy Spirit. And they talked about Jesus and Jesus being, have, being able to have a relationship with Jesus and Jesus being able to have a friend, being a friend and that Jesus wanted to be in the centre of my life and that I wasn't called just to be someone who turned up to church and it to be an unemotional uh, or, uh, or, uh, or lacking in power experience. But that God, Jesus, Jesus wanted to be at the centre of my life. As, and what they used to say was the Lord of my life, the leader of my life, the CEO, the, the director of my life. And that if I gave Jesus my life, that he would use me. At the same time, they talk consistently about the power of the Holy Spirit to be what I couldn't be myself and that the Holy Spirit would come and would take that commitment that I made to Jesus and would, would, would bring it to life, would animate it, would give it the ability to be true, that I could give my life to Jesus, but then I needed something more and that more was the Holy Spirit that needed to come into my life. And I still remember the day when that Catholic priest that I talk about often he came to me and he said to me, do you want to know Jesus and do you want the power of the Holy Spirit to be released in your life? And, the two, and it's a twofer. It was, you know, both went together, he said. And he said, because, and he said if you give Jesus your life, you will know the Father. Because as it says in, in John, he who knows the Son knows the Father and he who knows the Father knows the Son. And so it was like if I gave my life to Jesus, but but that I would then need to surrender my life also to the person of the Holy Spirit, allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon me and to change me. And I remember he stood behind me, the priest, and I remember he put his hand on my shoulder and he asked me if he could put his hand on my shoulder and, and then he whispered into my ear this prayer that said, God, I want to give you my life and I ask your forgiveness for the things I've done in my life that I shouldn't do. But I, I ask you to be at the centre of my life, Lord, come. And, and, I, and I, it's as if it was today and yet it was decades ago. I still remember the room. I remember where I was. I remember where I was sitting. I, I, I can picture it completely. This, this amazing sense that I struggle to give description to of this sense of the peace of God and the fact that I was loved and that something was different. That something was different. And I remember immediately this sense of God has purpose for my life. I was 13 years old. I was 13 years old. I'd gone for five weeks. It was the 7th of November. And I'd gone for five weeks. It was quarter to nine at night. It was in, it was in a kindergarten a Catholic kindergarten school, at a school. And what I began to notice that, that, that as I had given my life to Jesus and said, Jesus, you are my saviour and Lord because of what you did, 
I'm free. And that this Holy Spirit that I had invited into my life now came upon my life. And what I wouldn't know, didn't understand as a little boy, as a little boy of 13 years old, what I didn't understand was what the power of the Holy Spirit would do. That the Holy Spirit would guide, would lead, would protect, would fight, would make a way through circumstances that I could never have dreamed or believed could even be true. The Holy Spirit is the one that we, that we, that we simply pay too little attention to at times. St Thomas Aquinas, who is regarded as one of the great theologians in the church, he talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit is given to us at baptism um, when the Spirit comes into us and that there's subsequently these invisible sendings of the Holy Spirit through our life, these invisible sendings of the Holy Spirit coming to us. When the Holy Spirit tasks us with vision, with thought, with tasks, where the Holy Spirit speaks to us. The Holy Spirit works in our life and in miraculous ways. And that these in, and if we are open to Jesus, to, to, the, to the Holy Spirit, because of our commitment and acceptance of Jesus and, and the Father's love in our life, that these invisible sendings keep coming where the Holy Spirit keeps speaking to us. That's the story of my life. I have moved cities all because I heard the Holy Spirit call me to. I've started television programs all because in prayer I heard the Holy Spirit say. I, I got married. I've had children. I have done so many things in my life because of the action of the Holy Spirit to guide, to fill, to lead me in my life. The Holy Spirit is the power of God uh, in our life. Uh, saint Philip Neri, who, who was a, a saint just after the Reformation, who was part of the renewal of the Catholic Church, he talked often about the Holy Spirit coming into our life. And he, he talked about the fact that there were three elements to the Holy Spirit in his own experience of God, is that there was a fire that came upon us that there was a fire that came upon us to inflame our hearts so that we could speak in manners and in ways that were amazing and beyond us. I experience that often, but I'm not just talking about doing this kind of speaking, that we can speak in a way where we hear the voice of God and, and, and through our own voice to ourselves and to others. He also spoke about a faith um, that, that gave the Spirit in those days uh, that gave the Spirit opportunity in our life, that you have to have faith. I mean, think about it. Right now I'm talking about something we can't see, <laughs> that I can't prove except to look at my life. I can't prove it. You have to have a faith. So he said there has to be fire, there has to be faith, and then he said, and then he said the Holy Spirit sends an iron will. It's like iron, a will within us to establish us in holy obedience to those things that God has said. The things that God has said. We're living in a time in the world where we can stop and we can say, you know, why don't my children come back to church? Why don't my wife come back to church? My husband and my friends. We can stop and we can say, why doesn't any of that occur? And the truth is, it's not going to be your ability. It's not going to be your talent. It's not going to be anything else. It's going to be the power of God that we need in our life at this point in time. God didn't leave us. We were not left. When Jesus went back to heaven, He didn't leave us to live lives of powerlessness. But He called us to live these lives of power, impact, freedom and purpose. And He's the Holy Spirit that can come into our life that descended on Pentecost on this day that we remember that can change the totality, the completeness, the absoluteness of our entire life and our future. And if today, if today you wouldn't harden your heart, if today you wouldn't block your ears, if today you would open yourself and you would pray, oh, come Holy Spirit to me, 
If you would ask the Holy Spirit to come, the Holy Spirit will come upon you in power. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you ability, wisdom, gifts and talents and work in you in ways that make you a virtuous person in ways where you would be amazed by your life. The world needs you. But more than that, the world needs you. God needs you to experience His life within you. God wants life within you. And the Holy Spirit comes to animate, to bring His life alive in you. What would happen if you were to say to the Holy Spirit today, Oh, come Holy Spirit to me. I'm open. We sang a song a little while ago about being surrendered. Being surrendered. We all understand the idea of surrendering our life to Jesus. We understand the concept of surrendering our life to Jesus in such a way that He has the central part of us. But to surrender our life to the Holy Spirit is to, is to say, I accept mystery and I accept your power, your wisdom and that which I don't understand or don't see in my life. And I will go listening, not just with the ears of my mind, but with the ears of my heart in the steps and the direction that you call me to go in. The Holy Spirit is the very life of God that we are called to surrender to in our life that we can experience here and now. That will change the world. Nothing else but the Spirit of God in our day. Loving Father, we pray today that every one of us on this Pentecost day would experience your power, your might, your wisdom, your gifts that you would infill us with the Holy Spirit in such a way that we would be transformed people and that we, we would look at our life, we would look at the things that occur and we would be amazed and say, that was not me. I'm not that gifted. I'm not that talented. I'm not that capable, but it will have been your Spirit alive in me. Father, come and bless us wherever we are today in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Catholic Prayer and Teaching Service every week is blessing and helping people all over the world. Here's what people are saying. My spiritual journey has been so enhanced and blessed by you and Rosemary through the weekly prayer and teaching service. Thank you for keeping us all growing in our faith. These times are the most difficult we have ever faced. God is the only thing that will see us through. Join us today and share this week's Catholic prayer and teaching service with others so that they too can be uplifted, motivated, and blessed. Send friends and family to brucedowns.tv. Life will never be the same. Well, thank you for being with us, everybody. It's wonderful that we have been able on this Pentecost day to talk about the Holy Spirit. And I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon your life. In the middle of the week, we have our midweek service where we in particular pray for needs. And, and what's the answer? What, what's the power of God that meets those needs? It's the Holy Spirit. And so if you are in need of prayer or you know others are in need of prayer, why don't you write to this address or send this address to others and they can send in their prayer requests or just go to the tab on the screen and we will pray and we'll pray that the Holy Spirit works in people's lives. At the same time, look, al look along those tabs. If you want to connect to us, you can as well. But I also want to encourage you at this time that if, if you can support us financially, we can't do this without your financial support. And I pray that you would listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit right now. And that if the Holy Spirit gives you leading, that you would support us in order that we can share the message of Jesus and that we can bring the message of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit into people's lives. We can't do that without you. And finally, people often ask me, how do you discover the Holy Spirit? Well, I've found it in reading the scriptures. And people say to me, how do I get your Bible? Well, you just need to go to the store that's somewhere on the screen. Just go to the store and or under this address on the screen and you can, you can read the scriptures. And if you're wondering what to read at this point in time, why don't you start with the book of Acts? It's an amazing story. Uh, it's, a, it's a ripper that just you read and you go, wow, if only I could live like that. Well, I pray that you experience the Holy Spirit all week this week, but all of the time. And we'll see you next time. And don't forget, wherever you are around the world, God is never far from you. Oh, oh, oh.